For me, empathy is the capacity to recognize the emotions that other people are experiencing, the ability to feel what others feel, the ability to put yourself in the shoes of others. Empathy inspires kindness and generosity, and it leads to work with and for others. Today, I would like to share with you some experience, some stories of empathy, and how they inspire our community to reach the dreams we all share. I grew up in a small town in northern Mexico, not far from the city of Monterrey. One weekend, at the age of 12, my family and friends went camping all up in the mountain. And as you do when you are camping, you gather around the fire, telling jokes and stories, and it was great fun. Until a family friend started to tell us his story when he tried to cross the U.S. border. He waited until it was dark, he said, to cross the Rio Grande River, which marks the separation between the two countries. He was really scared, he said, because he didn't know how to swim. Luckily, earlier border crossers have left a car tire behind so he could float across. He jumped into the tire and quickly dragged himself across the water. Once in on the other side, he felt a gun on his head. He has been caught by the U.S. Border Patrol. He spent a horrible night in prison and was sent back to Mexico the next morning, where he waited until it was dark to try again. While I listened to his story, I stared into the fire, trying to imagine what he felt. How does it feel to cross the river when you don't know how to swim? How does it feel to feed a gun pointed at your head? When he finished his story, I asked him, why did you go back? His response hit me like a stone. I had no choice. I had to take care of my family, he said. I remember looking up at the beautiful starry sky that night, trying to understand what could drive a person to such desperation. That moment of empathy was defining for me. And on that night, I decided that I would do my best to put a stop to these desperate journeys. Journeys that fracture families, journeys that break the spirit of hardworking men and women, Journeys that sometimes even end lives. But what exactly could a 12-year-old do to help? I mean, I started, find th I started daydreaming about starting a large business that would provide employment opportunity for all those for whom crossing the border was the only choice. I mean, well-paying jobs would for sure spare them from midnight swims across the Rio Grande. Yeah, that idea didn't sound so bad at first. Until I learned that there are 220 million migrant workers around the world. That is 220 million people from the poorest countries who come abroad to work as a domestic worker, construction workers, or other low-paying jobs. I definitely needed to reconsider my business model. Creating thousands of jobs simply would not be enough. But where to start? Well, it was in 2008 that I came to Singapore to work in an investment bank. Oh, yeah. <laughs> at the same time, I started volunteering at IDA. IDA is a non-profit organization that provides financial and entrepreneurial education to foreign domestic workers. The skills they learned helped them to manage their money, make productive investments, 
and sustain themselves and their families back home. Something remarkable about volunteering at IDA was to hear the inspiring stories from our students. In stories of courage, stories of strength, stories of determination. Let me tell you about Josephine. When I first met Josephine, she has been working in Singapore for 20 years as a domestic worker. For 14 years, she had no days off. Can you imagine 14 years with no days off? This meant that she was not allowed to visit her family back home for 14 years. She was not even allowed to go downstairs to throw the rubbish. As you can imagine, she often felt desperate. Her employer asked her to sleep on the floor, next to her bed, just in case she needed a glass of water in the middle of the night. But these were not the most difficult hardships that Josephine had to overcome. The one thing she never got used to was the lack of food. She didn't have enough to eat. As a result, she often felt dizzy and had little energy to do her job. The only reason why she survived, she said, was thanks to her neighbors, who knew about her situation and used to hang a plastic bag with food by the window, so she could eat. Why did you allow this happen to you, I asked. Her response was simple, yet it explained it all. I have two children, and I don't want them to suffer what I have suffered. I will do whatever I can to protect them from experiencing what I have experienced. Now, this is another demonstration of empathy, of empathy and of profound, unconditional love. The dream of sparing our loved ones from suffering what we have to suffer. And so, all her monthly income was sent back home to sustain her children. Once again, I was humbled by the determination and resilience of low-income migrant workers who leave their homes in the hope to, over, to offer a better future to their families. As soon as she was allowed to, Josephine joined Ida to learn the discipline of savings. One day, Josephine comes to me and says, that she started to save regularly. $20 a month. One grain of sand at a time. I couldn't help thinking that $20 was almost as much as I spent on coffee and breakfast that morning. $20 might not sound like a lot of money, but to Josephine, it was her life savings. Often, it might not be more than $20, but at the end of a decade, it brings enormous transformation in the lives of our students, opening up new opportunities for self-development for future generations. As soon as I realized the magnitude of the impact I was making in Josephine's life, I made one of the most important decisions in my life. I decided to leave my job and join Ida full-time. Our students save, on average, $250 every month. Nine in ten continue their saving habits after they graduate. 66% of them invest in productive assets, like Muel, who's, who bought a pig, and is now her piggery is growing, and is supporting her family back home. Or Lisa, who bought a cow, a land, and is now employing 16 members of her family back home. Or Siti, who opened the first ever internet cafe 
back in her village, and now is providing internet services to her community back home. Invaluable investments that transform the communities from our of our students. It all starts here in Singapore and trickles down to towns and villages. But not only that, nearly half of our students provide support to businesses other than their own. 25% of them provide with startup capital. Others provide advice, business ideas, or even training to family and friends who are managing a business back home. In other words, our students are becoming agents of positive change in the local economies. This is the multiplying effect, a wave of change that may not seem massive when you think about the $20 Josephine puts aside every month, but that transforms communities. These results are possible thanks to the support of more than 200 volunteers who choose to spend their Sundays at our school. Let me introduce you to Brian, a wonderful Singaporean who works as a policy analyst. When I asked Brian about his motivation to volunteering, he said that when domestic workers walk down the street, we do not see them as pedestrians. When they walk into the supermarket, we do not see them as customers. When they take our public transportation, we do not see them as passengers. He said that somehow we tag them as if they were different type of people. And until recently, we even deny them with one of the most basic human rights of rest days. Brian says that by volunteering, it was a small way of showing his appreciation to the people who build our homes, our offices, to the people who take care of our homes, our elderly, our young. Brian dreams of a nation where prosperity does not only mean to have a strong and solid economy, but a society that nurtures empathy and kindness among all its members. Perhaps Brian's dream is not as far as we may think. In January this year, all foreign domestic workers who renew their contract will qualify for a rest day. This means that by 2015, all 206,000 foreign domestic workers in Singapore will enjoy a rest day. So, if you share Brian's dream of transforming Singapore into a kinder, more compassionate and generous society, don't wait. Be the change. See domestic workers as pedestrians when they walk in the street, as customers when they walk into the supermarket, as passengers when they take our public transportation. See them as human beings and value their contributions they make to this country. By doing so, we will be able to transform our beloved Singapore into the place where dreams come true. Thank you.